you know what. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here now as the 49th governor of the state of Michigan. And I know I didn't get here on my own. I didn't get here on my own, and a lot of people in this room were a part of it. And whether you're an old friend or a new friend, this is an important conversation that we're having. And um, the lieutenant governor and I have been talking about how do we make sure we stay connected to the people that um, you know, that are leading, the people that are living in, the people that are part of communities across the state. And the Lieutenant Governor suggests we do a, a tour and make sure that we open up the conversation of people, not just office holders, not just people of a certain age or from a certain part of a community, but to try to make sure that it's truly inclusive and so that we can do a better job staying connected uh, to the people. I think a lot of times, People look at what goes on in Lansing, Michigan, and know that it doesn't really reflect what's happening in the city of Detroit, or the city of Flint, or the city of Muskegon, or you name the community. I think every one of us, and united, feels like sometimes Lansing's not paying attention to what's happening at home. And so, to his credit, the lieutenant governor came up with this forum idea about how we do that, so we can tell you what we have done, but also focus continue to keep our focus on the things that really matter. Um, you know, I've been, I've been, we've been working really hard for the last eight months, whether it's proposing the budget or trying to find solutions or making appointments and feel good about some of the work we've done, but we got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, the budget that I introduced truly focuses on uh, equity in the education of our children. We've had historic inequity in the funding of education for kids where it's been by property tax, which means wealthier communities get more resources expended on their children than communities with fewer resources. And it's been exacerbated by the fact that for 15 years, they've been taking money out of education of our children. And so that historic inequity is what we sought to remedy in the budget that I introduced. Putting the school aid fund money back into the education of our children and prioritizing it so it's lifting up kids who are in poverty. So it's lifting up kids who need access to special education services. So it's lifting up communities that have career tech education. It's tripling the number of literacy coaches across Michigan. There's real equity that's been built into this budget. And I'd love to sit here and tell you that it's at work, meaning lifting up DPS by $22 million, which is the difference between what I proposed and what the Senate has passed thus far. I'd love to tell you that we are able to do that right now, but we still don't even have a budget done. I was at DPS earlier today talking with the leadership and the teachers uh, about the, the issues that they're confronting and meeting the kids' needs and why it's so important that we get this budget done. In that same budget, we doubled the earned income tax credit so that people who are working hard but can't get by have some relief coming from it in the form of a tax credit. A lot of different pieces of this that really are seeking to meet the needs in a variety of, of ways for people across the state of Michigan. But we got to keep our foot on the gas and keep pushing and stay strong and stay together. And that's, um, you know, the strength of this group around this table and around tables and communities that we're going to visit. This is the inaugural meeting that we're holding in many of these across the state. It's not a one off something that is at the start of what we anticipate to be a regular line of communication and focus. And I just want to personally thank all of you for making time to be here. This is the Lieutenant Governor's uh, brainchild, and I'm going to hand the microphone over to him and be a good supportive partner as he leads the conversation and as we build out a continued platform that focuses on the things that matter to everyone in this room. So thank you all so much. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to be too loud to yell at y'all. I apologize. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm really thankful that all of you have chosen to be here to participate in this conversation about how this city can thrive. And as the governor indicated, this is the first conversation of many we'll be having around the state of Michigan about how we can improve the quality of life of cities. Now, we started here in Detroit because this is obviously the largest city in the state. And so if we're going to have an agenda about quality of life in cities, it needs to start here. Now, I'm going to take a risk as a facilitator. 
but I need y'all to actually hold to this. Everybody in this room probably has at least seen somebody else in this room before, but I want to make sure that we're grounded in who everybody is. So we're going to go around the table, and all I want you to say is your name and who you represent. That's all I want you to say, okay? Can y'all do that for me? Yes, you send the governor, I can do that for you, okay? Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir, please. My name is Vincent Martin, I'm from the Forest Hill Southern Community. Thank you, see that? That was excellent, thank you. I'm a cultural trainer with the Good afternoon, I'm Lavender Davis, I represent San Diego Food Kitchen as well as Burke City Bank, and we're going to incorporate the Detroit Department Chef. Hi, everyone. Thank y'all for doing that in that way. I appreciate it. I just want everybody to be grounded because the, the purpose of having this particular table is that all of you are doing the work in the community. And I think too often the people who are actually on the ground doing the work are not the ones who often get audience um, with elected leaders. And so we wanted to kind of flip that on its head for this meeting. So I want to talk about, just give you a little bit of context around thriving cities and what we're talking about when we mean how we're going to improve the quality of life in cities across the state and really have an agenda that's collectively set to do that. So each of you, before coming to this meeting, you did a survey, and I appreciate that. And that survey listed out several areas of what I call buckets of how we can think about how to improve the quality of life in cities. And so this slide just shows that for everyone who responded, 64% of you chose generational economic opportunity as either the first or second most important issue when it comes to improving quality of life in cities. I want to be really clear about what that means. That doesn't mean that the other stuff is not important. But what it means is when ranking these particular five areas, this was the one that you all, uh, there was the most consensus around uh, this is what we need to do. And let me, uh, sorry, take a moment. So, in order to make this process accessible, because everybody can't be in this room today, we are live streaming this meeting 
um, on Facebook right now. That'll be available for you to look at and to share um, online as well. We're just, we want to make this, again, a collective and open process. And we're going to be doing the same for the meetings that we're doing all across the state. So this, is, this slide just has to do with the headlines that shows, you know, here are some things that have been happening. I'm in Detroit, and, you know, Angelica, thank you, appreciate it. It's a bunch of PBS up in here. But it's talking about things that are happening in Detroit schools, things that are talking about how um, low-income housing, low income housing tax credits have begun to move in the city, and, and all sorts of things here in different areas that are showing that there is opportunity, there is work that is happening at different levels to attempt to improve quality of life. But as the governor said, there is more work to be done. Now, I wanted to talk about this through a personal story. So y'all, this is kind of small, but basically that little, that little kid on the screen, that's me. And so I was born in 82 in Detroit on the west side. And my life is a series of interventions by people like you who have been doing work in the community to help position a little boy like me for success. It was when I was five years old and getting a computer from my grandmother and learning how to use technology for the first time. So the 1987 book, that's me at Golightly uh, Educational Center where I went to first and second grade, and that is me with my computer at Christmas time in 87. You fast forward to the 90s, I was a basketball player growing up. And so going to, uh, whether it was workouts at Kroll or at Seven Mile Lassa or working with my AAU team, Detroit Jam City, all the adults that helped to feed and to put sort of time into young people like me to help position me to be able to be successful and to stay out of trouble. You know, fast forward after college at University of Michigan in the 2000s, growing my career um, as an activist, or my career as an engineer, and ultimately leading me to be able to meet and work with President Obama. And then finally, with the work um, that people continue to pour into the community, enabling me to now be your public servant as a student governor. I say that because all of you are making these sorts of investments. These kinds of investments are what improves quality of life, not just for kids, but for every person in our communities. And so I just wanted to use myself as a little avatar for that. Now, with those opportunities, we know come challenges. And everybody in this room is doing the worst. I don't need to spend too much time on what some of those challenges are. But these headlines are just kind of a snapshot of some of the things you see. The fact that, you know, there still have not been enough black and minority contractors hired for some of our large major development projects, that we're still not seeing enough of the hours work by people. The fact that we still have a crisis when it comes to people having access to affordable housing, whether it's due with foreclosure or water or all sorts of issues. The fact that you know we still are having some challenges with infrastructure, particularly in our school buildings, and that's one of the reasons our budget proposal is structured in the way that it is to try to address some of that at the state level. So there are still things that we need to work through, things that we need to work toward to improve quality of life and public health. So we decided to structure this in terms of five key areas, thinking that if we can make progress in these five areas, that will help us make progress in terms of improving, improving the quality of life in the city of Detroit. And they are, one, available and affordable housing. This is one of the core needs that we believe that people would have is how can we make housing more available and more affordable. Second, on generational economic opportunity. Now, what the numbers you see in these budgets are, these are the percentage of people who responded who made this their number one issue. For, for housing, it was 11% of respondents. For generational economic opportunity, it was 43%. The third one is on environmental quality and justice, understanding that this contributes significantly to public health and to how people are experiencing this community on ensuring that we have an environment that supports life. The fourth is on kids in cities. Now that's framed this way on purpose because you know we believe that improving quality of life for kids is about education, but it's also about more than that. So we want to have a more comprehensive approach when we're talking about kids in cities. And the last is on mobility, transit, and transportation. Like I said, I was a little surprised that only 2% of people thought that was uh, number one, as a transit rider before I became lieutenant governor, I'm, I'm really surprised by that. But nevertheless, we believe that being able for it being more affordable, more accessible, easier for people and for services to move freely about the city in ways that don't depend on car ownership, we do think is um, a possibility here for how to improve quality of life. I lost that. So we're just going to go on in. 
So what I did have here is basically some slides that kind of summarize and frame the challenges that we face in these specific areas. I don't know that we need to spend that much time on that because again, as the people who are doing the work, I feel like you kind of understand the problem. So instead, what I'd like to focus the conversation on is how do we move forward with solutions in some of these areas? I would like to focus primarily on generational economic opportunity because that was what the majority of people responded as the number one issue. So I would like to call on, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask y'all for some volunteers, but the survey question that you, that you responded to talked about what did you feel like was the biggest barrier to progress on the area that you put forward as the most important. So I would appreciate someone volunteering to share with this group how they responded to that question. So for someone who said that generational economic opportunity is the most important issue that we need to improve to improve quality of life in Detroit, um, what do you think has been the biggest challenge or the biggest barrier to making that improvement possible? Can you speak up? Access to capital. Access to capital. So generational economic opportunity, if we are find ways to make capital more accessible and more and to flow better in our community. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Yes.
he got about thirty, and Karen gave him another fifty thousand dollars, and that was the balance of his tuition period. That's normal in the urban community. I don't know what that is, and that wasn't my experience. So you said generation. We're talking about opportunities for people, because they have that kind of life I just described. My life is student loans. My dad dropped me off to college and said, "Good luck." Right. Um, he had money to call at home when I was on the street. I had money to call home. I didn't get a job. I had a job. I had a job. That's what people's experience. I believe that's a common experience in our community. So we talk about what's going on in that area. And that's that's a lot of work. That takes too many lifts. But I just want to frame the conversation. We need to understand where we are. Black is what we have. We need to understand that before we move forward. Jobs, access to wealth, all piggyback off of, off of that. So you got to have that generational, what do you call it, mutual transfer in your life to get money throughout your life so that you most people don't have. You said black, black, black. I'm simply saying that. That's, that's the issue. Black, 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 black. black. Mm-hmm. You have to expound that. I'm not sure what you're up to. There's so many. The problem is that our hands are getting too. We got resources at the table. We can come into the city of Detroit and transform an economic oasis if we put our heads together. Is what I mean by blacks not buying the black people. We have forgotten, some of us have forgotten. Let's be real about it. Some of us have made a wonderful living in our lives and they went on their own trajectory, but a lot of we have left a lot of people behind. Yeah. Yes, sir. Specifically, when we look at the first school net allocation, and I, I really appreciate the information that you about education. When we look at the Midwest, specifically Ohio and Pennsylvania, their allocation is three, four thousand dollars more per student allocation, which ultimately reflects the budget. So you talk to, you know, when you talk public schools, it's ultimately about that per student allocation. And so that plan to raise the allocation to be similar to our competitive states, our neighbor states, I think would hold well. I appreciate that there's funding, there's investment, but the per student allocation really brings about how teachers are paid and what then creates the budget for you know the various school systems that are in. I appreciate that. Just speak to that directly quickly. That is a core foundational element of the budget that we have put forward. And so we appreciate anybody's advocacy to help us get that through reporting in the month. Yes, sir. I think when I ran for this, it was a fact that we were financing. We were financing this, we were not doing this. We don't know actually how money works, and how to get the power of revenue, and how to utilize those powers to create those uh, activities. I can just start spending dollars in my neighborhood. If we teach you how to have that education, if you're thinking about having this, you have to start teaching people young. So I am from a corporate detective. Mm-hmm. We just spent $422 million to FCA coming out of the income taxes off the people's paychecks that would normally go into the public coffers. We gave the coaches and the development of the middle school just a ring up $422 from the school tax fund. And then on top of that, we're getting a DPEN energy pension that guarantees profit while 200,000 people get energy shut off every year in DC territory. So we have a fundamental problem of systemic racism that's being recycled over and over because we're locked out of the political system. And we can't build generational wealth if there's no future generation. So we're building deep in a neighborhood that's flooding under climate. We're not going to have a future generation if we don't break this cycle of inability to participate in the democratic process. All right. Let's go right here. Shops 
and beauty supplies for them. Really getting into the trenches and knocking down those barriers because folks in the neighborhood that need to hear about these opportunities just aren't hearing. So let me let me use that as a jumping off point to talk about what we're what we're here to discuss is there is you talked about some of the barriers. And I think the sample we got is I think representative or illustrative, but I would like to understand and what we're trying to come out of this conversation with is if you had the power to be able to put in place some sort of practice, some sort of policy, some sort of program, you know, given your expertise and your experiences, like what would it look like? What does that actually look like? Because, you know, how this translates from our conversation into action is we want to emerge from this with a set of things we can do. So, and so I think that's a good jumping off point because I, I want to ask everyone again, bring what you're bringing to the table. You know, how would you, what would you propose that we, I say we as in us in the executive branch of the state level, we in terms of our state legislators, senators in the house, in the state house, we in terms of those who represent us at the federal level, and we in terms of those who represent us at the city level, like what are the things specifically that you believe could be done that would make progress on these issues in Detroit? So I want to start, you can go ahead, Terrence. Some kids want to start their own business. We want to make sure that our kids are in these levels at the only LLC and not align those kids who say, listen, I'm doing something different. Those kids still are successful as well. Then with the adults, we have some the skilled trades is offered in every school district. Now those electives are colored, it's passion based curriculum. Now those family members can get jobs. So oftentimes they feel like they're left out of the equation because there's nothing for them to that point of mission or mission state. Sure. 
workers, that we're going to be able to go and make sure we want to find out why these schools are destroyed, but we're going to look that student evacuated uh, our school, and we're going to help to empower that uh, caring and guardian. All right, thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Officially a homeowner, which then 
then you would allow for me to be a taxpayer, which would then put more money in the coffers for our legislative bodies to be able to return and appropriate some of those funds for services for the community, programs in the community. Um, this is a transformational process. And over the course of several decades, we've seen that deep erosion. And there's a direct question to the next I think these are all really good ideas, but I think we need to have something concrete that has been tested and we know works. And like your point about things that are tangible, like policy changes, we have seen examples of attacks on, on that over the, over the years. And there's some things that we can do to reverse that. So I just want folks to be mindful of, of again, some of the, it's kind of like the little things um, but it's establishing opportunities for returning citizens, again, through the right to be able to collectively bargain. Um, and to be fair, the state has a huge bargaining, and a lot of it is because of the preemption laws that have been created by the Republican Party, which don't allow for the school board, the city council, or the county commission to address these local issues. And we know all politics are local, so that's what I, I would let me for a moment. Here. I mean, uh, one of the big issues that I've seen is that the government uh, distrusts because you can't do trade. Our pensions have been paid plus hundred people over the trade. Step back and work so many years to save this cost of not a We voted for a ministry to improve our schools. The state has come out and taken myself. See, the state has been taking all the trade assets. There was revenue sharing for this. So she wants to come here and make something. It's hard to make something out of nothing without taking pictures of it. So I'm looking for a move from this administration to make you put a hole back here, first of all. You look at our revenue sharing back, uh, our dollars, and sit back and I'm making you have to overturn that right to work. So it's time to see some action from the promises that were made for the, that election. So I mean, I mean just, just get serious about this conversation. If the people don't have the confidence to come out and vote, they're not going to vote. I mean, we voted against the emergency manager to be overturned. It was forced back on to put in our corporation because we can't overturn it again. Those kind of actions create some distrust. And so we decided to make the church whole. We're just talking to the banks to, 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 to a board. Yeah, I appreciate that. To respond to that directly. So you're talking about things like increasing and restoring revenue sharing. That's something that is, again, one of the foundational elements of the budget that we put forward and, frankly, may be having a pretty ugly fight about during the month of September before that needs to be passed, and making sure that we are protecting people's retirement. That retirement that not only was taken from you by Republicans, but then was taxed on top of that by Republicans. And the core tenet of our proposal is to repeal that pension tax. So these are things that we have talked about that we are advocating for, so I appreciate that. That's something that we hear from the time we take. Yes, ma'am. I would like to say that this gentleman right here, I don't know your name. Gerald Woods. Mr. Woods has a point, and Michelle has a point, and Jennifer has a point. The trickle down effect that we have in this atmosphere of Detroit, it doesn't work. What you need to do, you need to build the wealth from the ground up. And if we got, we have 104 public schools in the city of Detroit that are lacking decent education for the students. And we have all these corporate giveaways. If we stop the siphoning of our tax dollars away from the educational system and put it into the schools that need it, it would change the dynamic. And what we should say is this, about adopting the school. Adopting the school. We had Ellisville and Gilbert Town. They had just taken over Detroit. Now we have FDA all coming through the back door, impacting communities that have been for generations. We have to change that and then get these corporations as we give them $187 million for a $2.2 billion expansion like they did for Maritime. Now we're giving FDA $487 million. Let these corporations adopt the school. We only have 104 public schools. Let them give $5 million to that particular school. Teach them about wealth and the handling, teach them wealth and financial literacy. We have to 
stop going and getting his lessons. He come and sat off the hall of the people and pecking at the coffers of our children. Our children are suffering because we are on the front line and the trickle down effect that the city is doing and the state is doing is not reaching the impact of community. We have to look at what it is. People come in poor as church models. They go out rich and clean, and our children still suffer from the bottom up. If we teach our children financial literacy and self-empowerment, there's nothing we cannot do. So we have to take the financial literacy, we have to take the adoption of the school, we have to take these corporate giveaways, dismantle them, dismantle these by uh, monopolies, and put them back into the children. And look at it. Look at the children of Detroit. We have so much... Uh, learning disability in our children that are not being addressed because they're being affected by the environment of water shut up, no food, and no lights in their house so that they can study to learn and to read. So we have to change that dynamic. We have to start with our children from the preschool on up. And if we don't, we're going to continue to lose. We're going to continue to lose. So we have to change that dynamic from the bottom up. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, the last We have a marriage plan of investing in certain neighborhoods that are targeting leading neighborhoods. When you talk about wealth, right? That wealth that they're able to generate from these white corporations that are going into already stable neighborhoods. You're telling us people who live on Texas, who live on this other thing, who live on this one, who live on that, we get what you think of what we can. That's the, best, that's the message that is being conveyed to, to our community that is contributing to many things that are, are being said, are being done. Where I live at the right, right at the next time, right at the uh, Lucid Air, billions of dollars have vested in the No bigger than this. So for the young brother, in, in, in reality, you know the young brother right, who live in this area, who ain't got jobs, who fathers are in prison, who mothers are starving, when they go to the next house, they're going to bother me. Why? Because this, I see access to that wealth. And I want that wealth by any means this is necessary because this is how I've been taught how to get that wealth. So how do we satellite within our community, more about within our neighborhood, not from an individual sector? Because I can tell you what I've done individually because I'm just one individual. So how do we collectively pull our resources together? What are the values that are going to govern how we work, operate and work from? Because we ain't all got it free. So we got to have some values. We got to pull our resources in terms of, of, of like, so we're going to work over here. We're going to work over there. And what is our strategy of how to achieve the, the, the thing that we're identifying? Is that, is that what I'm doing? Like, what are the rest of where we're good at? And how do we pull that together to, to address these issues? And many of the elements that we already know, but our, that's why I said systematic racism. Again, the city has 95% black, but 85% of, of, of the wealth and, 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 and resources are going to people that don't ain't black. I got that. Yes. I appreciate that. So, Nicole, here we go. All right. So, again, I, I, I like what I'm hearing. I want to hear more. What's the thing? Because I got you. What is the thing that we need to hear? What is the thing that you recommend as specific and as actionable as possible? Because, you know, bluntly, these conversations get frustrating when they're focused on principle and not action. Right? So, again, what can we, what can happen? What can we propose that gets done? Yes, please. Uh, I think it's also important to have a multi-generational approach. Um, I know for Matrix, not only do we focus on the children, but we also focus on the parents as well. And so our big focus is Head Start, which is early education, preschool. And while we are working with those kids to make sure that we're educating them, we also have a strong tie on the family, where as we're educating the children, we have family advocates that work directly with the parents who work with different kind of goals. If you don't have a preschool education, well, let's Let's try to teach you those things. If you don't have financial literacy, let's try to teach you those things. Where if you if you make a little money, let's 
try to budget that to see what are your next goals. We try to teach them how to properly connect, how to properly make goals, and how to attain them in a reasonable amount of time. And it's truly trying to change the way that they live, the way that they think, and we have had much success with it. So if we're able to have access to a lot of parents through their children and access to early education for preschoolers all across the state, I think that that would be a great component of making sure that we're educating them and also working with their parents at the same time. Well, just to piggyback again, one of the core elements of our budget is with the scale of the past and more access to early child education. So I think we should have that. Um, <clears throat> So, so thank you. I really, really appreciate these kind of conversations because when I hear some of the passion from the community, these are the same things that parents and board members and educators and leaders in the industry, this, we share the same passion. So to Mr. Woods, let me say, your concept is right on target. And we knew that last year, so we implemented something called Student Advisory Council, SAC. There is each and every one of our schools and those councils are comprised of school leadership, students, parents, labor, business community, and faith based. So at those meetings, you attack a couple of things. Absenteeism, you attack literacy, you attack infrastructure issues that can be within your control. You attack academic improvement, and what does that look like? So it wouldn't be a room full of people of this size, but it's more intimate and it's specific for the school of your choice. So that does exist. Mr. Wills, you talked about skilled trade. Absolutely. We cannot get enough help at Randolph. Randolph, we are closed because not only do we have some of the students who are appreciating those programs, but at 3 o'clock, the door is open to adults. And it's free. And it is something that has to be partnered with the city of Detroit and other philanthropic dollars because whether you know it or not, your tax dollars, my tax dollars, because I live in the city, they do not. Do not go towards the operation of Detroit Public Schools Community District. And so many times I see a group and people say, well, my tax dollars, what do you guys do with my tax dollars? It is paying off the legacy debt of Detroit Public Schools. It is not going towards the operation of the district as DPSDD. And that's an important piece of, so as we talk about education, because this was a high number one, of course kids were, so I didn't know anything on this and that, but I have to leave right another meeting, but equitable weighted funds. Of course that is what we want. Because when you look at the tax dollars, there would be a lot of problems solved if we could get the amount of money that we need. The sister in the back mentioned about students who we don't call them special education, we call them ESC students, exceptional students is what we term them, but the district has more than any other district, period. Yeah. And it costs much more to educate students with IEPs and ESC students yeah. than any other school. Let's just call the spade what it is. Yeah. And so if we have more, then of course we could be more funding than every other district. If 
that simple. Our schools deserve it as residents. We deserve it, and I'm glad we have this opportunity to get the solution. All right, thank you. Thank you. And I mean, I feel like I'm a broken record on this, but again. You know, for our education polls on the budget, moving to this weighted foundation allowance to address some of these directly, increasing funding for those exceptional students who have special and particular needs. It's part of what it is, so we need your advocacy, uh, continued advocacy on that. Yeah, we're we'll next, Dr. Forrest. You all talked about the foundation. I think more and more you guys were the policies that need to start changing. So if we talk about So, one, uh, my understanding is that we need close to time. So, I appreciate um, folks participating in this conversation and how you were able to focus and bring some of the other elements of what you work on to connect with the generational economic opportunity. I also appreciate sort of what we heard. There are definitely some, some themes and elements that I think bubbled up um, repeatedly and consistently that we need to take into account, whether it's sort of what types of activities and choices we are incentivizing, whether it is how we can prepare people, whether they're young people or adults, for success and to be able to actually fully participate in the economy in a way that they, to your point, is have enough literacy to actually do it. How can we um, make sure that there are opportunities for those to be able to invest in themselves and in one another? So you know, our team has been taking notes pretty copiously during this conversation. Um, Governor Woodburn was at the top of it. She said this was not a one-off. And I want to reiterate that point. This is one of the conversations we intend to have as we engage all of you and others in the community about how we build a collective agenda to improve quality of life so that this city can thrive. And so your participation in this conversation, I'm going to take that as a commitment 
to be willing to be in continued conversation with our administration as we shape that agenda. For those of you who say that very explicitly, like you want to see an urban agenda, well, that's what this process is. So that only can be as robust as it needs to be with all of your participation and all of your support so that when we come out of this process, it's going to take us a couple of months to go to all the cities that we want to go to in Michigan. But once we come out of this, we will need advocates working at every level to ensure that we can implement something that will work to move quality life in Detroit across the state. So with that, I thank y'all for participating.